This video is brought to you by Midway USA. Support the channel by choosing Midway for your shooting and outdoor supplies. Gentlemen, it is time to suit up. Oh, suits you, sir. Falkland Islands, good morning, shall we? Dead center. Nice. 200, fire when ready. Okay, so I am going to aim again at the lower left quadrant of the target. Okay. Because you're running with the 300 meter zero, right? Correct. And offset off. Correct. All right, let's see it. Wow, I mean, that was up at the very top of the target. I'd say keep aiming low. That was better from an elevation perspective, and it's on the left half. It's down behind some of this foliage that's overgrown on the top. Ah, the of enemy that. is hiding. Yes. All right, we're there. Fire one ready. Impact. Impact. 300, we're on. High. Impact, left shoulder. Impact, dead center, there you go. Yeah, th th that's still the base of the target. Yeah. 350. Dead center. Nice. Second shot was a little to the right, but still, you know, right in there. Okay. With the enemy peeking out the the um, the berm. Yes. All right, we're there. Let's see you do it. Impact. Uh, short into the berm in front. Hold. Hold. Sorry, I got bit by something and kicked the camera. Oh, okay. All right, we're back, I'm there, everything is better. Yep, short again, give it a little bit more. Oh, misfeed. Uh-oh. I'm gonna use a new magazine. It was about a uh, target high and then off the right. Okay, elevations there. That was off the left by half a target. Impact. That's it. Okay. Okay. All right, we're on. 450. Fire one ready. Yep. Impact. Upper chest. Yep. That okay. second shot was uh, a bit on the, the on the lower third quadrant left side. All right, I'm, I'm actually, there at five. I'm actually seeing Mirage through this right now. Really? Cooking off the gun? Yep. Yeah. Okay, elevation's all right, but you're about um, half a target or more to the left on that shot. Okay. Half a target or more, elevation okay? Elevation was okay. Yep. Is it? Impact. Okay. Lower, lower half. Okay. You, you I'll take that. One. Hey, 
You need another one. Oh, one more. I see. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I thought I had uh, cleared it. No. Okay, that was off the right. A half quarter to a half a target. Okay, better, but still off the right. Off the left. Off the left. Just short. Impact. Okay. There we go. Uh, I, so Josh, I'm, I'm suspecting maybe this is uh, worthwhile of doing a heat study, uh, on a heat, uh, heat stress test on it start down the road. Because you felt like you were maintaining the same hold, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I felt no, nothing different. Um, this morning we've shot some other rifles with excellent results with iron sights. Um, I, I'm feeling great today. I'm not feeling tired or anything. All right. Well, I know that we've got quite a bit of data that you, we've already recorded on this particular rifle as we've gone through and sort of uh, worked out a few kinks. So mm -hmm. why don't we head over to the debrief and we can talk through uh, how the runs have gone. Sure. See you there. They've said that snipers commit an act of ungentlemanly warfare. Well, guilty as charged, your honor. I hope you're enjoying the show thus far. Shows like this, they're brought to you by Slate Black Industries. But most importantly, we're supported by the patrons of Patreon and Utreon. That's right, this lovely group of men and women, they support us financially, intellectually, but most importantly, emotionally. So today I'd like to invite you, come, join us, become one of us. Together, we'll set our sights on the future development of small arms. But if you cannot, that's all right. We completely understand. We'd be just as happy if you were to leave us a comment right below. But for now, let's get on with it. From the bloke broadcasting corporation I, I realized we didn't really show off the uh lovely fashion show that we had going on today drip uh, you see i'm wearing a tropical shirt which would be uh very common for uh, royal hong kong police and royal hong kong the royal hong kong volunteer regiment to be wearing with the slr and i'm wearing a pre-1979 um, 1968 pattern um, fully lined jacket and I have no air conditioning it's about 30 degrees Celsius in here so I'm wearing nothing under this and I am sweating but this I saw this on eBay even though it's not quite the right size for me and I saw the print and I was just like oh that's so drippy I need it so it's a uh, a light sparse with a with with an, an odd it's an odd variant where there's two different shades of green Mm -hmm. not tropical you would die in the tropics in this as i'm dying in my living room right now um and it's a, an edge no dot for the for the connoisseurs see there's, and there's you see this is uh, the dots can you, can you spot the dots online yeah the, yeah there's uh, there's there's uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's some there you see these little dots yeah anyways and anyways we can stop nerding out about uh, dpm <laughs> variants because today we ought to be talking about the four times optic. Like this. So, the run was not disappointing to me because I knew it was an absolute piece of shit to begin with. It went far better than I expected. That's how yeah. low expectations I had. I thought that went okay <sighs> for, a, for a run with a suit. And Sad. it's suit, it's sight unit infantry Trilux. So the Trilux is the uh, the tritium illuminator. And so, the rest is um, self-explanatory. Yeah, so the tritium is adjusted on the top right here. And it glows red at night. So it is supposed to be a tritium lit day and night time capable 4X scope. 
an optic that was made about, what, 20 years before this? Yep. Even the shape is similar. Look, even the shape is not well, that far off. Aside from the fact that this is offset. Right, it, it is offset. But the hood, the shape of the hood is, is very similar. Yeah. With, with the knobs sticking on the side, it looks very... Um, it looks very... If you didn't know firearms, you would think that it was it came from a generation beyond this because it looks similar and it, it, it serves a very similar function. However, how it does it is very, very different. Yes. <sighs> I wanted these things to work because they look so cool on the SLR. I think there's good reasons why they... I mean, you see them in... Uh, in in theater photos of the era, but you don't see them as much as you should, given that they were intended as a wide issue to infantry. It's why it's the site unit infantry trilux. It's not a DMR. It's not. It wasn't meant to be a special issue. It's just meant to be an infantry issue. And this is forward thinking because this appears in the 1975 pamphlet first. This is light years ahead. It's just a shame that it's total tonk. <sighs> I did some asking around with the old and bold who were around in the day, and they said that, that actually the shortage item was the top covers. Oh, interesting. That they, had, that they, that they often had a lot of scopes in, invent, in inventory, but they didn't have that many top covers. But I don't really... Given how they perform in reality, I don't think that it was much, there was much love lost on them. You don't really see... You don't, you, you don't see enough of them used in practice... To think, everyone thought this was a great a great idea in a good week. The principle is great. The, tu- the the scope itself, the tube, is super robust. It's clear. It's um, it's actually got all things an eight degree uh, field of view, which for a prismatic optic of its era is totally great. It's got good clear optics for its mm-hmm. era. I Very mean, robust. It, the yeah. the the system itself. I mean, compare it to the three and four power original um, AR-15 issue scopes. Oh, light years. Uh, light, light years. years ahead. I mean, in, as, in terms of as far as the view, optical quality. Yeah, the optical quality is light years ahead, but the mounting system is just disastrous. Why don't we talk about this now? Now we've shot this optic more than once. What we what you saw was the um, I think that was a third time we pushed it through. Um, because the first two times we thought it, I was doing something wrong, but turns out not. Uh, essentially, what I saw in the field previously as we were shooting it, out of the blue, we get to maybe the 400, 450 yard target, and the shot would be completely off. C- entirely Standard. off. Standard. Zeroed, but off onto a different point. And once I find where it's shooting off onto it's then on a different on a different spot again i've also tried to zero it quick detach it well quick ish there 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 there, there. so it's supposed to be one. it's supposed oh. to be a quick detach option but when i did quick detach this uh, the zero was nowhere to be the same as where, where I zeroed it. You you might get lucky, you might not. Uh-huh. Um, mounting these, you see, this is this is not a very intuitive mounting system. There's one odd spring that does all the work. That's not hooking. Come on, come on. There we go. Oh, okay. No, no, no. That's working. You've got this funny serpentine spring that uh, goes on a hook. Ah, and now I'm suffering, I'm sweating. Uh, it goes on the sort of hook thing here. And uh, all of you who know a bit of mechanics are now going, oh my God, what were they thinking about this? Um, and then you've got a point of contact here with the elevation set screw in a V block. You've got a post in there that you can't quite see. So I will just get the rifle this post there. And that's what takes the recoil. And then you've got two bearing surfaces there, and you've got a double cam that controls your elevation from 300 meters to 500 meters, like that. Um, 
And then this just slides into the rails and you've got these tabs on the back that you deform so that it stays put and you want it to be absolutely force fitted and then never touch it, never take it off. But, but you know how the military likes everything to be taken apart to be cleaned. Some, you've got two points of issues, points of failure essentially. You've got the scope onto the rail and then the rail onto the rifle. And if anything goes wrong in any of them, it's, it's off. So much of it, there is so much potential to this. There's so much potential because the optic itself is very, very robust. It does have a tritium lit system. And having a force wide issued 4X quick detachable optic would have been killer for the British Army. Yep. Even if they did do some funny things like uh, the pointer comes down from the top, which is great in theory because the idea being it facilitates holdovers and keeping your eye on the target as the rifle jumps up in recoil. The problem is it's, it's not ergonomic at all because when you're observing, you have the tendency to drop the rifle because it requires less effort. But you can't do that. You've got to hold the rifle up higher to observe. And everyone's used to having something come up from the bottom. It's one of those things that sounds great in theory, but using it in practice is just like... Mm. And then in the uh, SUSAT, sight unit small arms trilux, which uh, goes on the L85, SA80, it's the same point of it the normal way up because they realized it was it was silly so but yeah it had potential it, it, it had a lot of potential the optic the the core of the optic itself was was the light transmission and everything was great the eye relief is classic for a oh. uh, for an optic of its era i mean i'm i am a specky twat i'm a glasses wearer i can't use this eye cup because i i i, I push my glasses up into my face you're meant to push your eye well, I, you meant, you're meant to, to push your eye up against it like that and squish it in. Well, the problem that I've also seen is if your recoil spring is, is loose and you push against it, you could move the yeah. optic. Yeah. Uh, just as a point of reference, here is 40-odd years of difference in optics design. This is a primary arms three-power microprism. So I've got usable eye relief from there. So there, it's a bit, it's a bit tunnely, but my optimum eye relief is here, which is freaking miles, because I've got, I mean, this is one where I, the closer I am, the better. Optimum is actually just there, but if I go closer, my glasses touch it, so you can imagine what happens with a 308. But if I'm back, I'm tunneling, I'm tunneling here, it's just about usable here. No, if Just you look about. at the if if you look at the footage of me shooting it, my eyes are right on it. Oh, but yeah. I had to consciously make sure that I wasn't pressing on it because that would that would affect the zero of the the optic because of the spring. Yeah, oh, it was an interesting couple of interesting uh, random nerdy facts. Okay, so you've got the elevation adjustment there on that screw, and you've got the windage adjustment there on that screw, and there's no clicks, and the graduations are. Basically, four mower. They're roughly four mower. It's a, it's a supposedly it's a hundred it's a hundred millimeters at a hundred meters, which is near as damn it four mower. Which you're you're aiming you're aiming with with a scope. You're aiming to increase the grouping capacity of the soldier, which this doesn't anyway. Um, it makes and you've got the rifle less accurate. Yeah, I, I scored. I scored, and what I what you guys saw me do on on this run, that was a good. That was a phenomenal run with this optic, mm -hmm. and I used more rounds to hit that whole course than I did with iron sights. Yeah, Th that's been my experience with it as well. Yeah, so you can see why you don't see that many of them in, in archive in archive photos of the of or footage of the era because it's just it, it gives you better uh, ability to observe but would not a set of six or eight power binoculars be better mm -hmm. so one case study we could look at is the the russians came out with the 1p29 which was a direct copy of the trilux scope 
bad enough to be copied by the Russians. But the Russians copied the good part, which yeah. was the optic itself. They d- used a different mounting system. It was a it was a non of course because it was on a side mount. There was no reason to quick detach it from a dust cover. So mm. they had a side mount that they could permanently mount it to, and it would just slide onto the side mount on the Kalashnikov, on the end model Kalashnikovs, which the 1P29 is, I wouldn't say it's fantastic, but in a world where there is no ACOG, 1P29 is actually fairly good. Mm. Um, but you run into the same issue because if you push your eye really tight on the 1P29, you would see the, the optic press up. And what the Russians did that was also different, they had cam pins for different calibers. So they could switch it between 54 rim, 545, and, and 76239. And so with that one optic, they were able to um, they were able to put them onto, let's say, machine guns or um, AKMs, AKE-74s. And um, even if you really wanted to, a Dragunov. Why would you? But yeah, um, and then the, the Israelis because mounted Russia these on yeah, uh, the Israelis <laughs> bought a load of these as well and mounted them on M- on M16s. But apparently, what they often did was uh, drill these through and take the quick detachableness off. And I was reading something from someone who was trying to ascertain if there was any difference in the cams, um, and uh, it appears not. It's just that it's three hundred five hundred on an SLR and it's two fifty four fifty on an M16. The distance, you're right. The distance just is, redefine is the distance, yeah. But it's yeah. the same camp. So the yeah, you're right. The the Israelis oftentimes how you tell the difference between a, an Israeli trilux is that you'll see a screw on the uh, on the little flip switch right here, um, and then those were mounted on the T handlebars, which mount onto the carry handle of M16s. Again, you don't need the the faulty part on this. In in my opinion, is is a whole mounting system itself. And yeah. so by eliminating that, it was usable? Mm. There's a photo I've seen, and I bet if I try and find it back, I can't find it, um, in Northern Ireland with um, a yes. Brit, with, an, with a, um, I believe it's a slick side AR, as they should be, um, with one. And there's a, there's a one that's easy to find back, which is a Royal Ulster Constabulary Mini 14. Yes. With one mounted on the highest. I mean, it's just like... It's like the rifle's it's like, down here and the sights it's like up a, here. It's like it's the old school. It's a GBRS mount. It's the hydro mm, mount of the day. <laughs> it's just it's just a bit of a it's a bit of a bit of a meme, but that's what they had and that's what they did. It's not like you could just order something from AliExpress for a hundred bucks that would probably perform better, like you can now. I think though, I think though, Mike, I think it's very easy to make fun of things like this nowadays because yeah. we have things like this, yeah. Or this. All this. Right. Mm-hmm. Same, same. But um, the 1970s is when this was first. It's so far ahead of its time. But the funny yeah. thing is, the lot of the others, the Dutch, had various scopes. And the, uh, there's one that has a fantastic name, which is the Kijker Richt Recht. So. That. Scope, aiming, straight. Aha. Uh-huh. Can't Not the curved deep. ones. It's a straight well, one. As opposed to as a well, that's not straight. That's a that's that's got a bit of a bit of a bend in it. <laughs> but I see. that's that's what they called it. Kijk er echt. I think and I think they did that to shorten it though, didn't they? Probably and possibly to get it out of the out of so much the of the mirage um, zone. The mirage. But they did with the Dutch did the same mistake just by, by having a mounting it on a sliding top cover. Yeah, it could not have been beyond the wit of them to have some kind of clamping mount. I mean, Picatinny hadn't been invented, but it doesn't have to be Picatinny. But the the modern clamping mounts made by UTG Leapers and um, uh, DS. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't been able to get a DS one. I've had to order a UTG, which is a bit disappointing. But anyway. Um, it would not have been beyond the wit of man, but I think it's it's possibly it's a we don't know any better, and it has to be taken off for cleaning anyway. We have to take it off for cleaning because we have to take it off for cleaning, even though it'll trash the zero if you take it off for cleaning. Um, so yeah, everyone made the same mistake. G three doesn't have this because it's a pressed steel 
receiver. So you right. you it's a G three is a much better scope mounting platform before someone's come up with the clamping with, ah, with a proper clamping mount. That's a mount. sound bite I need to capture from you. G three is a much better scope mounting platform. You've captured it. <laughs> I mean, I, the company that developed it, I don't know if they had any firearms or optics experience, but you look at this mount and it's like you've given a design consultancy who knows nothing about these things a basic rundown of here's what happens when a gun fires. So you've got like, so you've got the recoil lug there and then and we want it to do all these things. And then they come up with this, this solution to it and uh, and 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 the bean counters in uh, in the Ministry of Defence are all jolly jolly good chaps because no one's yet invented the really obvious solution of, uh, of of having something that clamps to the receiver. I mean, it seems like they 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 developed the entire thing and and okayed everything through the paperwork without ever testing prototypes. It might have been it might have been actually that with the average standard of shooting is. Most people didn't notice the difference. So that's an interesting thing that we are able to correlate back to nowadays. You know, let's look at the the American adaptation or announcement of the XM5 and the M7. It, an incredible amount of scrutiny from private citizens on the project. Yeah, there wouldn't have been. I've been there wouldn't have been any scrutiny yeah. from private citizens on this at the time. There would have been a couple of nerds like me who who shot civilian service rifle at Bisley. But you wouldn't thinking, have a YouTube great. channel. No, no. This was the era where, where Fuddle was spread by magazines and books and not by yeah. the speed of light. I, um, and in any case, you wouldn't have been allowed to use it in the competitions anyway because it's an optic. The other one is the, uh, the American M17 pistol. Mm. The amount of discharges uh in at inopportune times that that yes. thing has experienced but again i wonder if uh, maybe we this is a topic that we could do a little bit more research on i wonder how much of the procurement cycle involved actual field testing to this uh before it issue before it was issued out to troops i bet you i mean i've never seen any paperwork on it never seen anything with trials i'm sure someone has done it somewhere i i haven't I haven't read it, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if there wasn't a competitor. That if it was a, we're going to design this, or or we want you, company that designed these to design to design this. So it wasn't a competitive tender. There wasn't any point of comparison. The, right. the point of comparison was the rifle with iron sights. I mean, they they make claims in the uh, in the in the pamphlet that uh, the. The the ooh, actually I have it. I have it in they front of me. They all make claims in the pamphlets. Yeah. Of course, the range at which targets can be engaged in effective, effectively when using the sight at the lower sight levels varies from two to three times that of iron sights. By day, the optic sight assists in the acquisition and engagement of targets with low background contrast and at the effective range of the rifle, and is also a useful surveillance aid. And it's like uh, it sounds great. And it, it sounds, sounds great. Like something someone would pencil whip into yeah. existence. I'm so I'm sure that. That's what they intended for this to do, but it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, regardless, I, I, I will, I will not sell my Trilux because I do think it is an interesting piece of development in the SLR's history. Yeah. Now, if you've been following my channel and the previous SLR video, I am taking this rifle to finish brutality. Uh, it'll be the second time I'm shooting. An SLR there, but this will this will be mine, and I will be. Well, first time it was an early Australian one, and I was doing early issue LARP in 1949 pattern battle dress and 37 pattern webbing, and this time we're going for the end of service life sort of Falklands era. So I've got some 58 and some lovely drippy DPM, and I've got a few weeks to try to take this out to the range a few times and see if I'm confident enough to take it. And I don't think I'm going to be. So I might have to moderate my LARPing a little. Might have to make some concessions to not just brassing up the Finnish countryside. Um, and what I think I might end up taking is the primary arms three times microprism 
on a rail, on a, on a bolted on and loctited on rail, as a, this is what the suit site was trying to do, basically. That this is, that this is like, if they hadn't screwed up the design of the mount, what would it have been? I think that's legit. So you're telling me that you're making a what would Nigel do rifle? Kind of. <laughs> I like the way you put that. Um, what would, what would, what would, yeah, what were they trying to do with this? Um, I mean, this has the night capability, but with uh, LED illumination. Um, quick detach is silly. That's not, not quick detach. I mean, it's quick detach enough if you really, really want to. And then we'll have a rail that is rigidly clamped onto the, onto the receiver. Um, I think that is a legit um, accommodation, should we call it? A legit no, you, accommodation to the lab. I mean, test it all. Test it how, however best you could with the um, ancient relics of the era. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, then give it a go. See what the see what the intention for the yeah. SLR's potential. To be yeah. unleashed was because I don't think this is going to take too well to being in a in an airline transit case and dragged on trains and planes and automobiles, particularly as it's off the side. So even even if I don't take it off, there's a high likelihood that it's going to be pushed pushed to one side a bit, and I'm just like I'm not even sure I can support this in the case properly. Whereas we can go for something a little bit more modern. And hopefully beat Giga. I suspect that if you were to bring the suit scope with you, you would have gone through the entire deployment cycle of the suit scope, which is five minutes of it on your rifle, and then the rest of the time being carried in your knapsack. Yep. I suspect that the first the first time the beep goes, the bullets are not going to be going where the pointer is, and then yeet. Flip up the iron sights, and then, and this is why you see more top covers, just top covers, than you do suit sights in yeah. uh, in the archive footage. But thank goodness the L1A1 has excellent flip up sights. Indeed, indeed. Well, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks to my friend Mike over at Bloke on the Range. Thanks for uh, having me. Please check his channel out if you like content like this. He does plenty of SLR content over there. Um, he is going to be attending Finnish Brutality in mid-August. In about a month, yeah. Yeah. From, so From the date of filming. So um, check out his channel, follow his channel, and uh, tell him in his videos that Nine Hole Review sent you. Please do. But until until then, though, uh, I mean, I don't know if we really have to because we pretty much have the same, the same friends of our channels, I, I suspect. But regardless, yes. regardless of that, uh, until then, um, uh, our talking DPN top, DPM tops shall <laughs> bid you farewell and we shall see you on the range. Salute. <laughs> <laughs> Longest way up. Bye-bye. <laughs>